What is IDFC Climate Facility? Created in 2019, the facility has... A very warm welcome to everyone here at the IDFC Pavilion. Um, we also have quite a few uh, people using the live stream whom I welcome as well. And first of all, let me share with you um, that this event is co-hosted by the German Development Finance Insti Financing Institution Deutsche Entwicklungsgesellschaft, DEG, part of the German KFW Group and Africa Finance Corporation. So my name is uh, Barbara Schnell and I head the sector policy department at KFW Development Bank, um, the German Public Development Bank and as such member of the IDFC. And I have the great pleasure uh, to moderate this session for you today. Today we want to talk about net zero strategies of development finance institutions. And we want to explore how these impact shaping infrastructure and sustainable private sector development. In slightly more detail, we want to demonstrate that net zero strategies of financial institutions can be beneficial in two ways. They can foster both a climate and a development benefit. We want to share how we can consider these impacts and return elements to make the right investment choices. And based on these reflections, we want to illustrate what role development financial institutions have in supporting private capital mobilization for transformative and climate resilient growth and infrastructure development. And finally, we want to motivate stakeholders responsible for infrastructure development and private sector financiers to increase their activity for climate mitigation and adaptation finance and to seek support from us development finance institutions. So this discussion is important and timely. And let's look at our wonderful group of experts um, and a warm welcome to Monica Beck, Chief Investment Officer from DEG. We are still waiting for Ms. Ayan Adam, who is CEO and AFC Cap, uh, of AFC Capital. And Kim, we have Kim Pfeiffer with us, Managing Partner and CEO of AP Möller Capital. Professor Dr. Peter Heck, from the managing, uh, he's Managing Director um, at the Trier, uh, IFAS Trier University of Applied Science. And Dr. Michael Knaus, Climate Team Leader at DEG. So we will listen to different statements and um, presentations of all of our experts, how, however, not all in a row. We have packaged them a bit and we will have brief interview slots in between. And at the end, we will reserve some time for questions and also interaction amongst you. So we start with Monica Beck. Um, she is Chief Investment Officer at DG and Monica has studied economics then worked in the consumer goods industry and for ProCredit in Latin America. And ProCredit is a development-oriented commercial bank. In 2001, she joined KFW Development Bank, where she held various management positions. She also headed the compliance department of KFW Group before joining the DEG's management board in 2018. And Monica will introduce us to DEG's new impact and climate strategy with a focus on private sector development. Monica, you have the floor and about 10 minutes to speak. And I will give you a sign in case necessary. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Barbara, for this um, kind introduction. Um, warm welcome to my dear uh, panelist um, audience and also the audience uh, outside from Dubai joining us. I will give a little presentation. Um, somebody is moving the slides, I can do it. Ah, here it is, okay. Very good, excellent. So just a short overview. Um, the German development uh, system is quite complicated. You have DG and KFW. 
Uh, actually, DEG is a subsidiary of KFW. KFW is uh, one of the largest development banks worldwide, si almost 600 billion US dollars under management. Uh, the bulk of uh, the KFW's investments are in Europe or in, in, in Germany. Um, we have um, all the domestic uh, promotion um, subsidiaries here on the slide. International business, we have three entities. We have IPEX, they do basically um, ex export for European, export finance of European institutions. And then we have two institutions doing development work in emerging markets. That's uh, KFW, mainly for the public sector side, and DEG for the private sector side. That's DEG, founded uh, 62. 10 billion um, under management, uh, quite diversified portfolio, um, Latin America, Africa, Asia, same volumes basically, a little bit less in, in Europe and some super regional funds. It's astonishing that 25% uh, of, our, of our business is in Africa, although we act quite commercially because we don't uh, get funding uh, from the German government. We basically live from our equity, which we got 60 years ago, and we have to invest it wisely so that we can grow organically. That makes us more commercial as an investor. This is our infrastructure portfolio. It's uh, 2 billion under management, also quite diversified. And again, Africa is uh, even our biggest portfolio, which is quite a challenge um, because there's a lot of blending going around and for a commercial investor it's a challenge. But So we are very happy that our largest portfolio is uh, despite this tendency in Africa. Here's some examples of our renewable uh, energy finance. We have um, Uzbekistan, very interesting market for us where we financed um, a lot. Uh, three out of five uh, wind projects um, are financed by DG. Um, and uh, also we do a lot of um, solar there. Um, then we have another example, Cambodia, where we financed the first solar power plant in um, Cambodia with a um, lot of impact, which we, which we have there seen by this investment. Uh, 100,000 households get energy through this investment. Um, you know that in Cambodia there is a constant shortage of energy, so very important. And with this investment, we could offset 60,000 tons of carbon during each year of being operational with this project. Another example of our infrastructure finance. 70% of our infrastructure finance is renewable, but we also finance ports, roads, airports, and this is an example of um, an airport which we financed in Cap Verde. Uh, very interesting, who is knows Cap Verde knows this is a, le a country f um, composed by many islands, so the airport is a must. Also to attract um, high tourism, um, sustainable tourism, you need this airport. It has been one of our first sustainable linked finance loans, which we have provided to this airport, combined with certain KPIs on reducing CO2 emissions. Um, and uh, we started this project uh, this year. And um, yeah, it will be um, a good example of an um, airport, which can be as efficient as it can be in scope one and two. Scope three, we have to look at our sister company, IPEX. Um, they are financing airlines, and uh, they have this in their mind. We are also doing a lot on green hydrogen. Um, you see here an extraction of our good pipeline. At the time being, we mainly are in feasibility mode. As, uh, that means that we are financing pre-feasibility studies. We analyze economics. But we are proud that we will sign the first green hydrogen um, this year. Uh, and also worth to mention, we act as one bank. So DG, when it comes to areas where subsidi sub subsidies are involved, like in green hydrogen, because it's a not yet tested technology, 
we have access to the PTX platform of the German Development Bank, and we hope that we can do some combined blending, blended finance here in order to get this new technology on the market. What do we do in, in our strategy with regard to impact in climate? I have to say we have three goals actually. Profitability is missing there. As a commercial orientated bank, we always need profitability. Without profitability, you have no impact in climate on the long term. So all our projects have to be profitable, but impactful and climate um, relevant, at least on a portfolio basis. You don't have it in every project. Um, so we firmly believe that as a development bank, we have to work on all SDGs. Uh, but climate, of course, is a very important one. So we want to reduce our um, CHG emissions in line with Paris agreements. Uh, and we want to make DEG already carbon neutral by 2040. As we are a long-term investor, that means we already have to start now. So we actively supporting clients in their transformation. We continue to work with all sectors. Um, obviously not uh, fossil energy, but we are working with a broad um, um, range of sectors, cement, steel, etc. So we are trying to bring their footprint down and at the same time enlarge our renewable portfolio. And what we have still in emissions, we have to compensate so that we already started to invest in carbon sink projects worldwide. Um, I think in the interest of time, I skip it, but this uh, slide is interesting. Uh, you can't work on reducing carbon without measuring. So we spend a lot of time in measuring our footprint, and we are quite proud that we have measured the, our carbon footprint in all our direct investments now. And of course, in indirect investments, we partially have to work with models. In the dark um, or the grain area, light gray and dark gray, um, that would be the involvement of our portfolio without mitigation. Um, so that would be very high. Um, so we are trying to shift our portfolio more tran towards transformation. And you see the dark gray area with the emitting portfolio will go down. Um, the intensity, that's the blue line, will even go down further because we want our clients also to grow. So total carbon emissions will go up, but the intensity um, will go down. Of course, we will have arrest end of 2040, the gray area, that we will compensate with carbon sink projects. That's the green area. And below, do you see the transformation area? That's basically um, the carbon emissions we save through transformation. And this is also our high risk area because when we don't reach that, we will have to compensate more above. So that's uh, in a nutshell, DG and our climate impact profitability strategy. Thanks for listening. And I move back to <laughs> you, Barbara. <laughs> Um, thank you very much, um, Monica. So I have a, a, a couple of questions for you. Um, so DEG has a pretty ambitious uh, climate strategy uh, aiming to reduce the portfolio carbon intensity by two thirds. How does that influence uh, DEG's uh, investment decisions when it comes to infrastructure? Uh, it it influences. Can you hear me? Yeah. Is the mic on? Yeah. Um, in, it fl influences in a way that um, first we can't invest in certain technologies any longer. So we have stopped investing in fossil energy and in gas. And um, that is not an, an easy decision because we are aware that uh, partners in the development world still need gas as a bridge technology. But if you have the goal of being CO2 neutral by 2040, it's just too costly. We can't, it would be too costly to compensate. So that's the reason why we, we said we do not finance this any longer. 
Um, it also, we are looking for more renewable investments. Uh, of course, everybody wants to invest in renewables. Um, there's a tough margin uh, pressure on, uh, on profitable uh, renewable projects. So as a bank, which has to make profit, um, we also um, need other areas of infrastructure finance, like port streets, uh, telecom industries, which we do. But of course, um, the CO2 budget can't be too high, so we are working with them on individual pathways for every client we have set uh, a target and we are jointly working on it to bring emissions down uh, with um, technical assistance and with, with finance. And the good thing is that through the regulation in Europe, it's like a kind of pull factor. Everybody is interested to bring emissions down. This has changed a lot. Uh, you are no longer in the world of uh, believers in green. It's really a, a business case. So this is helpful for us. Yeah, and I think um, throughout this session we will hear more about uh, exactly these two aspects you just pointed out. Um, and then DEG has funded quite a number of uh, renewable energy projects and you just alluded to the fact that it, it's also a tough competition, a tough market out there. Given the experience, where do you see the challenges in meeting the objective of tripling the production of renewable energy until 2030. I mean, that's a goal which is uh, communicated by a, a number of countries at this COP. Yeah. Well, I'm not so pessimistic um, about it because renewable energy uh, is much cheaper now than before. 25% um, in the world um, of the energy mix is already represented by renewable energy. And I think it will increase because there is a regulatory pressure uh, pricing is going down. There's a gen young generation asking for this. So I think I'm not, not worried that we will not reach this target. Mm -hmm. And last question for you. Um, you are about to fund the first um, hydrogen, green hydrogen project and you showed it to us. Where do you see the challenges in funding green hydrogen? Yeah, green hydrogen is a challenge. Uh, first of all, it's an untested technology, at least at larger scale. We have so far in the world only small projects. And um, yeah, it's uh, if you try to, to renovate your bathroom, you see how difficult new technology sometimes can be. And, and this is really as a, as a much larger scale. So the devil is in the detail. And um, so we have to invest a lot in, in training, in skills. Um, to, to make this happen. And then there's also the off-taking side. Uh, you need strong, good off-takers and you need the infrastructure to, to off-take. Um, and you have to produce a lot of renewables. Uh, you mentioned it in the previous question. And you need the renewables for, for energy. And uh, hi green hydrogen is consuming a lot of renewable energy. And to meet both goals, there is a kind of contradiction. You need by far more renewable energy if you at the same time want to serve uh, green hydrogen. So that's another challenge, another challenge for that. Yes, thank you. Um, so now we've heard the perspective of a development financing institution and now we will hear the company's perspective. So let me introduce to you um, Kim Pfeiffer. He's managing partner and CEO at AP Muller Capital. And Kim was an executive board member of AP Muller Maersk Group and um, former CEO of APM Terminals. Um, and he has extensive management experience in investments and operations within infrastructure in developing economies as well as mature markets. And you will uh, present to us how to decarbonize supply chains by backing new business models with green capital investments. So Kim, you have the floor and we will have to do the logistics here. Me coming out first. <laughs> All right, thank you very much uh, for um, giving me the, uh, the opportunity here and um, you know, I have a couple of, of slides here. There's a lot of uh, numbers uh, involved because uh, I, li I like numbers. Uh, but if it's uh, too much, then uh, just uh, just let me know. Um, 
so we are in a in a climate emergency, and uh, and, and global global logistics is uh, is part of part of the uh, part of the problem. Um, so before we get into uh, to the to the real uh, meat here, and just uh, to set the stage here, I mean uh, AP Moller Capital that I'm uh, representing uh, is part of the uh, AP Moller Group, um, and uh, and this is a company that are heavily involved in uh, in global shipping, global uh, container transport. Uh, you know, and uh, and also uh, with with tanker vessels sailing liquid uh, fuels around uh, in, in in the world. Um, the last uh, twenty six uh, vessels that we have uh, ordered, uh, they have uh, what what you call dual dual engine capability, so they can sail on uh, heavy fuel oil, which is the classic <coughs> fossil fuel. But it can sail on uh, on uh, on methanol, on e-methanol uh, as well. And uh, the picture to the right, that's uh, that's from our name giving in uh, in Copenhagen of the first uh, e-methanol container vessel in the world. And it was a uh, name given by uh, Ursula von der Leyen from the uh, from the EU uh, Commission. So uh, AP Moller Capital, uh, we are an infrastructure uh, fund manager. Uh, just uh, about six or seven years uh, old. Uh, we invest in, uh, in critical infrastructure, in, uh, in high growth markets, typically in, in uh, emerging markets. Uh, we do invest in uh, transport and logistics infrastructure as well as, uh, as energy uh, transition uh, in infrastructure. Um, as you can see, uh, we have a, 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 a range of, uh, of institutional uh, investors. And we are very proud that uh, that also uh, DEG uh, has uh, has uh, committed and supported us uh, as an investor in our, in our company, and uh, and then we have a, a number of Danish pension funds, uh, institutions from Singapore, Abu Dhabi, Paris, and uh, and uh, and Germany. <coughs> so uh, that's something uh, we're very uh, very proud of. So. Um, so decarbonization of uh, of shipping. Uh, this is uh, part of the discussion uh, of uh, decarbonization of what we call hard to abate uh, sectors. And um, basically, seventy five percent of uh, of the problem that relates to uh, hard to abate uh, sectors. And uh, shipping, uh, in its own right, um, is at, is three percent of uh, of the total total problem. And um, and you can see power is is, is about thirty percent, or maybe some of you you have more uh, fresh or, or precise uh, numbers. But this this is roughly uh, how we uh, how we uh, understand it. And the problem is also that the cost of uh, abating or getting rid of uh, CO two emissions in power and road transport, for instance, that's much cheaper than it is in uh, in shipping and uh, and um, you know buildings and. Uh, no, sorry, building oil and gas and, and aviation and so on. So, it's quite a it's quite a a, a challenge. And um, how how uh, we should solve that together? That's really the core of uh, this presentation here. So, if we talk about shipping alone, that's the three percent problem we are we are talking about here. Um, to uh, to decarbonize uh, shipping, uh, that would take roughly investments to the tune of two to three trillion US dollars. Um, so that's, that's of course, uh, the vessels with the engines and so on. But it's also all of that infrastructure uh, to uh, produce um, e-methanol, e-ammonia, biofuels, um, you know, uh, hydrogen, uh, nuclear, wh whatever the solution is, uh, is going to, uh, to be. And um, the maritime industry's contribution to uh, to solving the problem uh, that means that we have to be uh, uh, net zero latest by 2050, according to the Paris uh, Paris Agreement. Um, and all of this to produce all of this uh, uh, what we call a green fuel uh, that will uh, require a lot of uh, new supply and a lot of new uh, demand. 
Um, and there's a lot of supporting infrastructure that needs to be put in place to facilitate uh, all of this. And when I'm talking green fuels now, then I'm not talking green fuels necessarily for fueling vessels. It, it, it's, it's green hydrogen, methanol, ammonia to, to be used for anything, as we saw on, on, the, on the previous uh, slide. So, uh, so the situation we have is that we have to um, get infrastructure uh, built in the global south, and then we need to have transport infrastructure to transport it to the global north. This is simplifying a, a little bit, but it, it, this is by and large what this is uh, all about. Um, and this uh, decarbonization uh, to facilitate to facilitate all of this, all of it, that is about 25 trillion US dollars that has to be invested uh, and put into production before 2050. Then you will get rid of the 75% problem we, uh, we, uh, we talked about. And our role, uh, that's very much on the, on the transport side of it. Um, so the storage of green fuels, uh, bunkering terminals to, uh, to fuel uh, the vessels, uh, transportation of, of the green fuels, uh, port infrastructure to, uh, to, uh, to decommission what has already been built, and, um, and also uh, port and terminal infrastructure to support uh, offshore wind, uh, wind generation, just, just examples, actually. So um, just concluding the, uh, the presentation here, then, um, I mean, to make these uh, 25 uh, trillion US dollars uh, come together uh, with uh, the free uh, market forces and so on, there, there's a lot that, uh, that uh, governments and uh, investors and operators and regulators you know, have to come together around to, uh, to make this uh, happen. So we need to create an environment where, where it, it's sustainable to, uh, to make all these uh, investments because otherwise it won't happen. We need uh, regulations. Uh, and as, um, as was uh, explained uh, uh, before also, I mean, the technology is, uh, is, is a question um, and, and the gap between uh, the cost of this compared to what uh, the market by itself would, uh, would pay. So it's quite a, quite a challenge. So uh, I tried to put uh, uh, together a concluding slide here to spur a little bit of, uh, of, of discussion, a call to action. Um, so um, so what, what from the private sector's point of view that we see that the governments and DFIs can, can do to uh, to help all of this, that falls really into uh, into uh, three or four three or four uh, buckets. So um, we need to promote uh, abatement uh, by setting ambitious uh, targets, not only by 2050, but we need it already by 2030 and 40. You know, if uh, if you order a vessel today, uh, that can easily last for uh, for 20 years, and um, in our group we actually have. Um, a target of being net zero by 2040. So we have a little bit of, uh, of time to, to give if, if something goes wrong. So it means that when we order a vessel today, we have to think about 2040. And that's why the last 26 vessels ordered, they have the ability to sail on, uh, on dual fuels. Um, global standards, uh, local policy maps, so investors, they understand you know, what's the framework? Uh, can we trust uh, uh, this country or, or, or this region for, for our investments? Um, if you uh, can promote first movers and fast followers by uh, giving grants and guarantees and so on, because this, this is kind of a nascent industry and, uh, and maybe the alternative for capital is something that is more safe, but we need to create an environment where people they lean out and take a little bit of, uh, of a chance. Um, enabling uh, alternative fuel pathways. So, uh, so there's a cost gap right now. So if you have, um, let's say you sail a container from, uh, let's say from Shanghai to, uh, to, uh, to Rotterdam, and that costs roughly uh, 1,000 US dollars, um, then the fuel component of that, heavy fuel oil, depending on the oil price, is maybe, let's say $200. Then if you used 
methanol or ammonia if it existed, which it doesn't, but theoretically, based on the production cost we see, then the cost of fuel would be like $300 instead of $200. So that, that's kind of the dimensions. But if the shipping line's profit is uh, $10, which is not unusual, you know, then, then there's, there, there's 90 or $100 missing somewhere. So that, that it has to come together somehow. And that, that, is, that is where everybody have to, uh, have to chip in. Um, yeah. And then, of course, investing in companies like, uh, like us to, uh, to improve the energy efficiency. So, um, so that's my point. Uh, anything this hard does not get resolved uh, with a global uh, diplomatic committee. Uh, it gets resolved with uh, small groups of, uh, of highly motivated uh, actors uh, that go off and uh, get, stuff, get stuff done. That's the message. Thank you. So, <coughs> before we go to the interview, the little interview, we have another um, presentation. Um, thank you very much, first of all, Kim. Um, and now I'm pleased to introduce to you Professor Dr. Peter Heck, who is Managing Director um, IFAS at Trier University of Applied Science. And Peter, you are a Professor of Applied Mater Material Flow Management covering the research areas of circular economy, zero emission, bioeconomy, and climate protection. And um, you studied biogeography geography and political science focusing on East Asia and you obtained um, your doctorate in 1994 and you worked both um, in the public and private sectors since 1996 in 40 countries in the Americas, Africa, Asia, Europe and Oceania, Oceania and you um, have enriched this young field of science a lot by this work. And you chair the Institute of, uh, for Applied Material Flow Management, IFAS, um, which is a prominent non-profit think tank in Germany. Yeah, and you started to, um, a um, project. You will present to us um, SAREP, and you will explain it to us, a pan-African infrastructure project combining green growth with carbon removal. And we are very, very curious to hear about it. Well, thank you very much for the introduction. The longer the introduction, the older I get. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> so um, thank you for joining this little session and for listening to my little presentation. Um, why am I here? Justification is I'm from the greenest campus in Germany, a zero emission campus for since 25 years now. And in this campus, my institute has been working for 22 years now, transforming companies and communities all over the world from fossil uh, systems to a kind of renewable energy system. So I think I'm quite competent to talk about this uh, to you. And uh, the project I'm going to show you is based on uh, some problems we see. Um, the problems means um, climate change problems, but also we have another other issues like migration issues, we have poverty issues, and we have biodiversity issues. So if we spend a euro on climate protection, it should also be spent on other things. It should be secondary use of this euro. Uh, because um, we have a lot of problems coming up in the other fields. And for example, if you produce hydrogen, you're not doing nothing for biodiversity, for example. That's why my project um, uh, wants exactly to tackle these issues. Demand to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, demand to capture carbon dioxide, demand to enhance biodiversity, demand to provision new sustainable materials. Um, Kim mentioned it, we need new fuels. Um, and demand to create jobs, provide shelter and food and education. Millions of people are without this, and we have to take care of this as well. Well, the bad story I can tell you is uh, that um, the blue part we are working on, it's not working actually, and the green part we are neglecting. So we already have at least one teraton CO2 or greenhouse gases too much in the atmosphere. Even if you stop tomorrow with emitting anything, this teraton must be taken back. Uh, this is something we also have to think about. 
Um, how can we do this? Um, I'm a biogeographer, as uh, was introduced. Um, soils can store carbon in huge dimensions, and they should do because they get better by doing so. The oceans get worse by storing carbon. They're actually acidifying. They create a lot of mineral water, actually, in the oceans. This is um, actually a game changer. If we develop new land, like desert land, into carbon sinks, this could have a lot of benefit, not only for the climate, but also for the people, for the biodiversity, um, and for new green materials. That's why I'm here, I'm a member of the Montaigne delegation in this COP, um, because we signed a contract on, or not a contract, the LOI, on developing 22 million hectares desert land into a huge carbon sink by producing also green fuel. So, we should talk. Um, we have a, a, a very ambitious project, how can this happen? Very simple. Land is nearly without cost, energy is uh, plenty, and water is close, ocean water. With solar energy, we can desalinate water for 40 cents per cubic meter, even lower. But we, we can 40 cents, and then we can start planting trees. <coughs> trees are growing if you give them water in the desert. They're very nice trees, even self-fertilizing trees. So what we can do in Hector, you see here, and uh, we start doing this. Um, we have different plants. We did plantations ourselves 20 years ago. We start in the uh, West Sahara. We talk to people here, Sahara, experienced people, what can grow, what should grow, how can we make it a very efficient growth. Um, we produce biochar. Biochar is a very nice material because you char biomass and then you bring the biochar on the land. I'm not collecting carbon dioxide and pressing it somewhere in the, in the underground where it's not to be useless. No, I'm pulling on the land. On the land, it's creating fertility and it's actually fixed carbon for the next 2,000 years. Um, well, for the um, politi politicians I'm talking to, I make a very simple picture like this. Um, water, desalinated, nutrients, plant growth, carbon sequestration, and biomass, whatever you want. For example, BASF, the big chemical company in Germany, they have a big problem. If gas is no longer of use for them, where is the carbon coming from? For the plastic. Yeah? We need carbon. And it can be green carbon. <coughs> We start uh, next year with a pilot plot. We look like this, wind or solar driven, 600 hectares to show the investment companies, the bankers of this world, that if we put water in the deserts, we have plant growth in dimensions. Yeah, because it's something I'm always asked, how can you do this? Uh, that's why you have to have a showcase. This will be a showcase um, happening at this place. This is the bar game we are doing with Montana government. It's a 40 kilometer wide, 500 kilometer long, and actually 20 meter high sand dune of no use for the Mediterranean government. And this is going to be our new uh, photosynthetic carbon dioxide pump. Um, yeah, what you see here is, um, to make a long story short, our initial pilot plot is hobby. Um, you see the water price is at 80 cents. With this, you cannot really do agriculture, not in the desert. Uh, that's why here we have a very, very bad payback and a not sexy IRR. If you do it bigger scale, yeah, economy of scale, then your water price is 30 cents, 40 cents, and then it's getting interesting. That's why we must think it big um, to have the economy of scale and to invite big companies like we're talking to BP and Shell about green fuel, they're talking about the, the BSF about green carbon, but they only talk to you if you think in hundreds of thousands of tons. Yeah, that's why it should be big. We expect to have a positive um, cash flow in 15 years approach. Actually, we will be, be run for 30 years, uh, certification period 30 years. Where's the money coming from? Mainly carbon credits, of course. We put carbon in the sand, yeah, and then this we can have certified, and the certificates we can sell to the market, regulated market or voluntary market. We are still discussing with the Mauritanian government. Uh, we need a uh, price per CO2 ton of 80 euro, starting. But I think this is a range what you're also planning to pay now. Um, so what are the objectives of the project? To put it in a nutshell, green business opportunities. I want to make global uh, climate protection as a business to invite the business community get away with the government because they cannot do it. Mobilizing private investment, offering competitive product portfolios, 
climate change mitigation and adaptation. Mauritania is one of the most affected countries. Um, industrial scale biomass production and hydrogen is a collateral of our project. Regional development, giving people food and shelter and education, inhibiting migration, not by pushing people away, but giving them something to stay. And then biomass products for industry, what, whatever you wish, oil or timber or pellets, whatever you need. We are tackling ele at least 11 SDGs, so we are beyond gold standard with our certificate. The system will be, as you see here, um, we even think about recovering brine. Um, means not putting the salt, uh, the brine back into the ocean, but putting it on land and then recycling it into many really interesting materials. The Mauritanian government wants to treat iron ore in Mauritania, reduce iron ore to uh, hot, hot brigade iron, means a reduced kind of iron ore, which is a pre-product for green steel. <coughs> It will be organized like this. There will be a private company organizing it, uh, and the government of Mauritania will actually invest in the pipelines, in the water transportation pipelines, and the private company will single out the 10,000 hectare blocks, 200 10,000 hectare blocks, and this will be sold to investors. Summary, we use state-of-the-art technologies, nothing new, no rocket science. Every, everybody can see it everywhere. It's just in another scale, and we mix it differently. We offer affordable water for the local population. It's a side effect, a collateral. Mauritania people don't have water. Um, solar wind power generation creates infinite water resources, so there is no limit to uh, water. Um, water, land, solar energy nexus creates carbon storage and green carbon production with mitigating and storage. Cyber offers long, so large scale opportunity to produce sustainable steel. And we also invite people, also refugees, migrating people, to be educated, to stay there and work on this value-adding project for the Sahel region. Green business model for climate mitigation, carbon storage, poverty alleviation, greenhouse gas, neutral production. That's it. Thank you very much. I got my 10 minutes, right? Normally, I'm talking 45 minutes, so I should, no, yeah. Um. So I think um, our uh, last expert has also joined us. So maybe uh, may I welcome you on stage as well, that everybody gets to know you. Ayan Adam uh, from uh, African Capital, um, fin African Finance Corporation. Yeah. So um, before uh, you introduce your climate uh, institution's climate strategy, let me just ask um, a couple of questions to the um, presenters whom we have just heard. Um, so first, let me start with you, Kim. Um, what has motivated um, AP Muller, Muller to go for such a comprehensive climate strategy? That's my first question. What's the major motivation behind it? Um, so, so. Um as a, as a fundamental in, uh, in the purpose of our company, then uh, it is to, uh, to do good while doing well. And um, this, is, um, this is something we uh, as a team uh, believe in uh, a lot, but it's also something our shareholders uh, believe in a lot, and therefore it's, uh, it's a very good idea. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, you know, in, uh, in, in business, you always have to... Uh, to uh, to have a purpose where you where of course you need to uh, make money, but uh, but there has to be a purpose that goes beyond uh, making uh, making money, and uh, many of us in uh, in the company we have been doing international uh, business uh, in uh, the most uh, uh, remote parts of uh, of the world, and um, and uh, one thing that kind of give us. Uh, uh, satisfaction that is to see things uh, being built and uh, getting to uh, to work and thereby creating jobs uh, for uh, people in parts of the world where it's really needed mm -hmm. um, but that goes hand in hand with uh, tackling uh, global warming and tackling food poverty and uh, and uh, and all of these uh, things so um, so that's really what uh, what is behind that mm -hmm. And um, Kim, your fund is part of the world's leading logistics companies. And how does your investment strategy 
climate oriented fit into the overall core business of your company? Um, so, um, a little bit back to uh, to the question from before. I mean, we are ultimately we are a foundation owned, you know, uh, group and network of uh, of companies, and the foundation ultimately have a purpose of uh, providing welfare to society at large. So that that kind of binds us together. So we are for profit, but ultimately the purpose is to uh, lift welfare at society at large. So it's not a it's not a foundation that is for uh, you know giving money out to. Uh, to to the Merck family or anything like that. It, it's it's a welfare purpose. Mm -hmm. So uh, so building sustainable businesses. Th this is this is the mantra for everything we uh, we do. Mm -hmm. But uh, we operate as uh, separate and uh, independent uh, companies. And also in in our case, uh, we have you know we have different. You can say shareholders from, for instance, the uh, stock list, the company of the group, in the sense that we have uh, institutional investors, right? So our responsibility that is uh, to uh, to do well while doing good for mm -hmm. uh, for all of them mm -hmm. so it's the way you define your core business really um, um, that brings it all together then yeah, yeah thank you um, and Peter actually your project um, seems too good to be true to be honest um, <laughs> so why do you think it will succeed I mean it's a huge effort you're undertaking there piloting starting with a pilot mm -hmm. Um, this question I am always asked, um, first of all, uh, where is the plan B if it does not work? Because we need to store carbon, uh, we need to avoid emissions, but we need to store carbon. And so far I don't know many successful carbon storage projects, which are not monkey business actually. So um, that's why it has to work. And uh, we're talking to big companies, we're talking to engineering companies, they know it's possible, it's done. It's possibly uh, it's possible to be done in uh, 10 years or 15 years in this scale. Um, we have um, we talk to potential off takers. They tell us if you make the first move, we will be the second mover after this. So they are not the first movers, but they told, told us yeah we need it, especially for the maritime section. Yeah, they need fuel, uh, and uh, they have a price issue. So whenever we can get into this price line, they would be partners for this. We talked to the German harbor management. We tested. Uh, plant oil with the ships, and we can just use it without without, without uh, changing the uh, the engines. So we did a lot of preliminary work, and think yes, it's possible. And um, we signed this contract with the Mauritanian government, or we have the land now, um, and we will start next year with the first plot to show that basically the idea works. And then I hope um, we will get people interested, investors, to start the big thing. And in order to start the big thing and uh, succeed in the end, what type of uh, support do you need from the political level at this COP mm -hmm. and also from the financial sector, specifically the development financing institutions? Mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah, with to politics, I'm very critical. After 40 years in public service in Germany, I, I lost my trust in this. Um, so I more focus on uh, private investments, on maybe on, on institutions like uh, the one Kim represents to really get get going very quickly. You have to just do things and then policy will follow because they see it works. They are not afraid to, to, to put too much stress on the company because the companies are anyway doing already. So I'm not so much um, with expectations about the policy. In the national finance organizations, of course, um, we, we, we have an equity problem. We don't have a financing problem. Uh, it's always the same. Yeah, when you start new, uh, nobody wants to give you anything. The banks are popping in when the, the, the meal is cooked. Uh, so I have my equity problem for the starting point. That's why even for the banking section, I'm, I'm not so, so keen. We are looking for private investors, for the big families, the family business in Germany, uh, working with local banks for connecting this money. We start small and then try to get quick, big very quickly. Yeah, I will uh, remember that uh, phrase. Uh, the banks crash the party once the meal is cooked. Yeah. That's, that's uh, something to remember. Thank you, Peter. Um, so and now I'm very pleased to introduce to you um, Ayan Adam, Senior Director and CEO of AFC Capital Partners. And um, Ayan 
brings 27 years of leadership and a strong record in emerging markets investment, asset management, private equity, infrastructure, and climate change related financing to the table. So exactly what we are discussing today. And her particular focus has always been Africa and Asia, Asia as well. And prior to her current position, she headed the private sector arm at Green Climate Fund and also has a 17 year career with the International Finance Corporation, IFC. And you hold an MBA of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT. And you will present to us um, AFC's climate strategy um, with particular focus on critical infrastructure. And you have the floor. Everybody else has or always stood up. You can. I'm just making place okay. for you. So I think um, before I um, look at the shaping the transformation, we focused on resilience, but AFC's overall strategy in climate is uh, actually a lot more comprehensive. Um, AFC as an institution, we are $11 billion investment grade rated um, private public development finance institution. We play in four key sectors, power, um, transport, logistics, industrial parks, as well as um, natural resources and what we call heavy industry that are focused on import sub substitution. So in terms of climate strategy, today I'm gonna to focus on the resilience. What does it mean to, uh, to look at infrastructure in the context of Africa? Uh, but in the power side, today we're the largest uh, owner of renewable energy in wind. We have 1.1 gigawatt and we have a pipeline of another one to two billion gigawatts that we'll be building in the next several years. We had acquired Lakela, but um, before that actually, we were quite a big leader in building one of the first uh, wind power plant in a small island state, Cabiolica, which we invited AP Muller to come in later. Uh, we also just finished Djibouti. And so we, we don't look at, we, we're not looking for projects that are cooked. We actually do from cradle to grave. We are a big originator of projects in the African context. Um, so um, also I think our um, logistical parks, we had created one of the first logistical park in Africa in Gabon. It's a sustainable timber, FSH certified. Uh, I think our colleague Ape Muller also uh, part of that. Um, but we were involved in the initial design and getting this project to where it is today. So in the context of us, our, our role is to solve Africa's issues and to really fill in the infrastructure and industrial gap. We cannot do that in the current climate context. This is why we are focused on both the mitigation side, adaptation side, and how do we support the continent to industrialize in a clean way. So this, that's at the core of our climate strategy. We're also very mindful in our heavy industry uh, portfolio to really cut shipping emissions, which is uh, as if shipping was a country, it is really within the top five. Um, and, and a lot of our import substitution strategy is really aimed at that, is how do we produce closer to the mineral resources? How do we create employment? So today I'm gonna focus on um, uh, um, the fund that we launched. Um, I've started at AFC three years ago when, and we established our asset management arm. AFC Capital Partners, and we have a fund in the market, the Infrastructure Climate Resilient Fund, which its focus is to really integrate IPCC 6 in terms of the kind of stressors that we are seeing, but also uh, integrate low carbon considerations. We can go next. I can do it myself, perfect. Oh, I didn't know. Okay, <laughs> uh, climate change is a global issue. It is affecting us as humanity in the same way. So in the context of um, uh, climate being a global issue, Africa in particular with, um, and, and it really causes and, and impacts are 
are today very important. And the causes and the impacts are affecting us in the same way, uh, no matter where we are. So at the current warming of 1.1 degrees Celsius, we're seeing stressors that are having significant impact on our agriculture, our um, 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 fragile ecosystems, the oceans, the lands, the infrastructure that we are building. Africa has a very low infra infrastructure built. We have a, a, a huge deficit of around 2.3 trillion cumulative. A lot of that is actually still yet to be built. So there is an opportunity here to integrate um, physical climate risk into design, construction, and operation of our infrastructure. Um, and what do we mean by that? I hope I can now manage. Oh, God, today I'm having a hard time. my fault, okay? Uh, so in terms of um, what do we mean by resilience? Um, I think we are looking at the science. What does the science tell us about resilience today? And what we have done is that we really took a lot of scientific evidence from the latest IPCC report, looked at the, it, w w how does it manifest in the context of the African continent? Uh, we are seeing significant droughts, which has a huge um, um, issues on both the agriculture, the land that we need to, to, to feed ourselves, but also in the terms of the physical infrastructure that crack up um, because we are still doing a lot of things business as usual. Um, we have erratic rain patterns that have had a significant drainage. Um, it, it, you know, just a year ago, Nigeria was underwater. You have many countries that are underwater, and this has a huge drain on, 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 on our current um, uh, infrastructure and also ecosystem like our ocean ecosystem and others. You have sea rises that are impacting our port infrastructure. Um, and then what you have is the rising temperature also is, is having a havoc really on not only agriculture but anything of a physical. Um, and we haven't captured here but also we're seeing new diseases as a result of that. So the causality of that has not been fully really um, pinned down. And, um, and, and just in increased emergency. You don't know where the next hurricane is happening in the African coast anymore. So um, why is this important? I think from a transformation point of view is that we believe that this has a significant impact on people, it has significant on livelihood, but it also has a significant impact on asset prices and longer term insurance as we started to understand um, and as there is a move to really disclose the physical climate risk we're gonna see. So for us, it was taking this responsibility for our continent. Our institution is only focused on Africa. We've done projects in 40 African countries and we enjoy uh, privileges and immunities there. So it's, it's really looking at how do you integrate this new warmed globe and this new scenario in the way we now look to design, construct, and operate our infrastructure. As I said, opportunity for Africa is that, um, like in the mobile arena where we didn't have to focus on landlines, we can start doing that now so that we can preserve assets and pre preserve and adapt to this impact of climate. And what we said was that um, in, in, in an effort for us to, 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 to look at this transformation, we would need to take four critical steps. There is this important to collaborate with everyone. It's very important. It is not only, I think we are in one globe and it, this is the only home we have. And we are working with other partners, understanding the science, understanding um, also the sources of finance that are necessary to really integrate physical climate risk in the design and construction of infrastructure um, and really supporting, uh, codifying what is adaptation. 
and how does that link with profitability? So it's not just a risk, but it is really going to impact the longevity and also the, 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 the risks that, uh, uh, that we are putting. Uh, we will be delaying our future generation. If we build things and we've taken a lot of loans, that would mean that we have built infrastructure, we have indebted the next generation with something that is gonna be either washed away, crack up, or just will, will not withstand the uh, forces of nature. Um, so I think in conclusion, um, we are really working with everyone to try and g gather sufficient amount of capital for this endeavor that we have started. We have, as I said, launched the Infrastructure Climate Resilient Fund. Um, we were fortunate to get a first loss capital from the Green Climate Fund, and now we are approaching our first close, but there's still a long way to go to reach our $750 million target. Um, so that's, the, um, that's what I wanted to highlight today. And, uh, and for AFC, we are very committed to the region. We live in it. I think it is um, something that we take it seriously because it's a place that we live that we want to see improvement on. So I think I'm going to say thank you and uh, look forward to collaborating with everyone in this room. Thank you. Okay, um, Ayan, now a couple questions for you. Thank you for your presentation. Um, so you um, told us that um, AFC is one of the largest infrastructure finance organizations in Africa. And um, how do you incorporate climate impact um, of your infrastructure in your investment decision? This against the background of the guiding principle of common but differentiated responsibilities. Maybe you can elaborate on that particular point. So I think, okay. So what we have started to do, you can hear me, yes? Yes. Yes. What we have started to do is that um, uh, over t two years ago, we have actually, one is to have the approach and the philosophy, and second is to really in to get the resources you need. So for the first time, we have climate scientists in AFC. Um, for all our projects, we do a baseline um, analysis of what's the emission profile. Uh, this is new in the last two years. And then we see how do we integrate um, low carbon considerations, specifically in our industrial parks. And in, in, in the context of resilience, we actually uh, spend a significant amount of resources to build a model that can really look at an infrastructure before we get in. It's best when you're designing it, or if it's an expansion, we can take that into account too, because most of our infrastructure are still at the early stages. Trade is still not big, there's not much inter-trade. So we believe that this is a long-term assets. So there will be many phases to any port, to any, um, so what we do is that we take those into account for industrial parks, we look at uh, what's the, uh, what, what is the power u usage? Uh, we also look at is there opportunity to plant trees around some of this so that there's uh, much absorption capacity. So these are how we live and integrate. So it is part of our um, credit memo, uh, what is the mitigation potential and what's the resilient opportunity as we go forward. Thank you. And if you look at these two factors, um, what, where do you see the most pressing challenges in having infrastructure compatible with um, what the Paris Agreement says? There are aspects um, that, um, firstly, I think the Paris Agreement could be further enhanced on the resilience side. So, mm -hmm. and I think um, the new European taxonomy is actually looking at resilience and adaptation a lot more uh, uh, clearly. So in terms of uh, Paris compliance, I think every country has their NDCs, right? And w a lot of them focused on you know, power sector, uh, renewable energy, but we just did, we redid Nigeria transition plan, for example, we, 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 we did a pro bono of that. And we looked at, because when it was submitted, a lot of countries did it very fast mm -hmm. in an effort to get the the agreement in place. 
But when you look at it carefully today, um, we look at Nigeria's energy plan um, to see what is, you know, what's the trajectory, what was reported to Paris, and we find that in a country of 200 million people, even if it's growing at 5%, even if you do, I think we said 5 to 7% growth rate, even if you put in all the new energy as renewable, you will still have a residential, you will still have increase in emissions, yeah? Because mm -hmm. for, for us, we like to speak with numbers. We have to do the baseline and then we have to look at. So it was, it's unexpected for Nigeria to cut its emission by just transforming it into full um, renewable. We would need to conserve land. Um, and, and we're doing a further study to see where can you get, I think there is still 100 million tons of net increase by 2050 if the country actually grows and we increase the penetration of energy. Mm -hmm. Even using just renewable and um, gas as a baseline. However, if they use their abundant gas resources, you are still at 180. And it's 100 to 80, it's, 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 it's a little bit more. And if they invest in their mountain projects, they can net that to zero. So our view is that there is a differential path for each country taking into account what resources they have. So we cannot expect, it, it, it shouldn't be theoretical. It should be done, you look at each country, you look at, except when you have <coughs> corridors of infrastructure that come through countries uh, or roads that are coming through countries where you still need, you can have an opportunity to replant in those pockets mm -hmm. uh, due to the fact that it's an increase. So I think the area of infrastructure was slightly understudied uh, in the run up to uh, Paris. So what we are doing is we are adding more rigor and for us we are looking at what's the baseline and then what's the mitigation potential. It may not be from just the energy but it could be from other resource like uh, increasing the carbon sinks in that area and so on and so forth. Yeah. Well, thank you. And you um, very uh, well illustrated for us um, that it's a very differentiated scenario for each uh, country and region you're looking at. Okay. Now we're looking forward to our last input. Um, we hear now from uh, Dr. Michael Knaus. Um, Michael, let's, let's call you Michael in this context, is an environment economist and holds a PhD in environmental science and previously you worked um, as a senior lecturer and researcher at the Institute of Applied Material Flow Management at the Trier University which we are already um, familiar with and um, you executed in the last 20 years research projects in the field of material flow management zero emissions and circular economy in uh, over 60 countries in five continents so you know the entire world uh, what this is concerned. And you will present to us now the resource and energy efficiency checks, a DEG business support service um, to develop net zero transformation pathways in cooperation with your clients. And you also volunteered to draw the conclusions for us of this session. So the floor is yours, Michael. Yeah, thank you very much, Barbara. I'm the climate scientist of DEG, and I just figured out that uh, I got to know Peter in 1998, so we have our 25th anniversary this year together, and we started the institute's journey in um, 2000. Officially, it was founded in 2001, and we worked for the first time for DEG in 2015. That was the project Biru, by chance, and we had the pleasure to also do Cabiolica and do a 100 plus X renewable energy strategy for Cape Verde. I have no idea when it was, 2015 to 2018. And so I saw so many similarities in the presentations. And now I try the same. Huh? Good. And I would like to give you a very practical example how we are organizing transformation. And how we are looking into our portfolios. So we have clustered all the portfolios. We have looked into our total infrastructures and we have analyzed the total scope one and two 
on real-time client data wherever we had them, and scope three we modeled via our joint impact. And then we looked into all our business segments, what is the total emission carbon intensity per one million financed in the fertilizer industry, in IT centers, in toll roads, in mobile services. Because one of our transformation elements is that we are at the point of origination, at the point of acquisition, looking into how green is the business, how carbon intensive is the business, and if we find it carbon intensive, how fast can we transform it? And what would be the commitment and the climate policy of our clients? <clears throat> so as um, Monica said, we are going out of gas already. So by 2030, we are halving our fossil energy portfolio, and we are trying to complement this with renewables as fast as we can. And therefore, investments like Together with AP Muller is something what we are absolutely interested in. What we do is, um, in transformation management, we are spending our time with the high emitters. So whoever has more than 10,000 financed tons of scope one and two, or more than 100,000 absolute, we are trying to look deeper into it, whether it's Paris aligned, yes or no. So we are looking first the KFW sector guidelines, are they applied? We are checking then the total emissions and where can we reduce it, whether we are financing any type of lock-in effects. So it's very basic, uh, aligned with the MDB principles, very basically what the AFD is also doing, Propaco is doing. And I'll give you an example. Whenever we feel that a client could transform more, we're offering technical assistance. We have a so-called carbon advisory and reduction initiative, CARI, and the resource and energy efficiency check, what Peter's team is conducting, what formerly was my team, this is one of the core parts of how we are doing transformation. So Kari consists of helping our clients to set up our own climate policy. It could help the clients to get their carbon accounting right and get their target settings right. But it's also if we have production industries, if we have infrastructures that we are looking together with them how could you optimize your business? How could you optimize your business competitiveness by reducing the resource and energy demand? And we are investing quite a substantial amount into feasibility studies for new coming businesses like green hydrogen, ammonia, and the like. In Rex, we found out that if we are simply looking into the cross-cutting technologies, whether it's illumination, compressed air, pumping systems, heat and cold storage, if we are looking into all these type of technologies, there are so many energy efficiency gains which we could receive where we could easily double the energy efficiency level. And this is, uh, as you like numbers, this is our number. What it should show with the trajectory, the blue line is, if we are looking into a company and their compound annual growth rate, this would be their baseline scenario. This would be the emission level which would go up. And then we are looking into all types of technologies which could help them to bring them down. And then we are looking what of these technologies is economically already feasible in meeting the IR expectation of the client. And then we are ranking them. We are going to give them a kind of a CAPEX and an OPEX blending. And we say, OK, look, this is your must-have project because it's increasing your profitability. This is a long-term strategic project. And this is what you could do if the pricing of, say, LPG or for any type of carbon border taxes are increasing like this treasuries. And then they have a very clear transformation pathway. And we do expect that they are following these pathways. This will be part of the climate ASAP, so the environmental, social, and action plan. And then we are checking whether the clients are decarbonizing over time. And you see, we are reducing them up to the residual emissions, because very seldomly in the production industry, there will be an absolute zero. And once we have brought them down, then we take our share and we neutralize our share in this business. This is how we are organizing transformation. This is how we understand it should be done in infrastructure. We are doing jointly together with AFC, five of these recs for five of AFC's clients in order to also demonstrate how could that be as a TA service organized with our core partners in Africa. And I'm particular interested to see whether AFC also could join up 
with Peter's initiative, no, as you are one of the front runner also in biodiversity, in land restoration, and you saw that you have in Africa a giant potential to help us in Europe also with your carbon abatement. And with that, um, having seen that all the panelists are basically doing and looking into the same direction, I'm a little bit more relieved to come to the COP, uh, because I see there are some tangible outcomes, even if it's on a small level, not on the high political level. And I wish us all the best and success. Thank you very much. supporting IDFC members in enabling knowledge exchange and offering capacity development on